Well, good morning again. Good to see everybody here. If you will, turn with me to John 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Y'all bear with me. And no one in life is immune to tragedy. No one in my life is immune to disappointments or heartbreaks. We, we all have experienced anguish on multiple levels and at different degrees, every one of us. And some we expect, some things we don't. And the ones, obviously, that we don't expect are obviously the worst. Uh, and we find ourselves really in a state of distress, sometimes disbelief and shock. And when that happens, we say to ourselves, how, could, how did these things happen? How, how did it get this way, oh Lord? Or, or Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Um, and if you've ever found yourself in a predicament like that, well, you're in good company. Because I certainly have, including this past week. And it's been a whirlwind, man. It's been, you know, it's been something, not just because I lost my brother, but I have some people that are very close to me whose lives are a train wreck. And they seemingly don't care that it's off the rails. And so I found myself praying, Lord, help me. I mean, I just don't know what to do anymore. Lord, help me. I, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what to do. And so I have to leave it in the Lord's hands. So if you're like me and you found yourself saying these things, saying these very words or something similar to that, then, again, just know you're in good company. You ain't by yourself. So in a text that we're going to look at today, the disciples found themselves in such a position. And when the Lord informed them of the things that were, was going to take place, to say it was, they were upset was an understatement. Um, so in typical loving fashion, the Lord, He comforts them with words of encouragement. And that's why I've entitled this, The Comforting Christ. So if you will, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse 1. He says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me but the Father. Comes to me, comes to the Father but through me, excuse me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace, for this opportunity we can be here today to preach your word and to study your word. And Lord, we thank you for the comfort in Christ. How would we make it without you? How would we get through without your comforting spirit in our lowest points? Lord, you're a great God. So Lord, I ask your blessings on this message today. And Lord, that you be glorified and lifted up. And Lord, I pray that you bring comfort to every heart here that may be heavy today. And Lord, if need be, conviction. And so, Lord, I pray your will be done. In Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. Now, the scene that we're going to look at is one of those moments where the disciples have been told in advance what's going to happen. I mean, they've been told several times, and, and yet they're not expecting it to happen right then. Now, given their love and devotion for Jesus, uh, they're probably thinking, well, how could this be happening right now when he delivers the news he's going to deliver? I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that this was absolutely not what they had in mind for that evening. But the man whom they had come to believe as the Messiah of Israel, the son of David, who would come and restore Israel, uh, restore them back to their former glory, has just unloaded on them some of the worst news of their lives. And the look on their faces says exactly what they're feeling in the moment. You know, facial expressions are a dead giveaway to surprise or shock or pain that someone is experiencing. I'm one of those people that was not blessed with a poker face. You can look at me and tell if I'm mad, glad, or sad. I mean, there ain't no getting around it. Uh, and the same can be said for these disciples right here. Jesus had already seen their hearts. Their face told everything, but he'd already saw their hearts. He knew what was going on in there. 
And he knew that this was going to be more than they could bear on their own. So he begins to speak to them these words of comfort. And for our first point, I want us to look at the Lord's gentle admonition. The Lord says to him in verse 1, He says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Now one of the basic rules of Bible study is when you come to a chapter such as this one and you read a statement that suggests a certain mood or situation, in order to get a feel for what's going on, you've got to go back to the previous chapter to find out what's happening and what's got you to this point. And it's obvious from the Lord's statement that it has caused some great concern and sadness. And this is not what the disciples wanted to hear. This caused us to ask a couple of questions. Why were disciples troubled? Well, there are several reasons to look at here. First, Jesus has revealed His betrayal. In chapter 13, we have the Lord washing. He's washing the dirty feet of the disciples. He's, he's partaking, they are partaking of the feast of the Passover. And after He washes their feet, He shares with them the significance of serving one another. And here's what happens in chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus has said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Now, bear in mind, on several occasions, Jesus has shared with them that he would be arrested, that he would suffer at the hand of godless men, and he would be killed. Now, he's told them this several times. This is really not a surprise. However, this is the first time that he mentions betrayal. And worst of all, he divulges it's going to be one of their own that's going to betray them. They're the guilty party. The guilty party is right there present with them. And this is very unexpected and certainly unwelcome news. They don't want to hear this. So verse 22 says, same chapter, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. And in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 26, 22, he says, Being deeply grieved, they each said, began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord, surely not I. Well, now listen. The first thing, this puzzled me. Why would they say, surely not I? Wouldn't you have said, which one is he? Because I want to get the dirty rat. But they didn't ask that. They didn't ask that. They're completely taken by surprise. It was unthinkable that one of their group would conspire to do such a, a dastardly deed to their loving Messiah, to betray Him. Well, let's don't get too comfortable right there because Jesus ain't done. Watch what He does. Next, Jesus reveals His departure. Still in John chapter 13, down to verse 33. Jesus says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek Me. And as I said to Jesus, all right, as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now as the old saying go, goes, and the hits just keep on coming. Well, they're, they're coming. And the first one was that one of their own is going to betray the Lord, and now he's going to leave them, and he's going to where they're not invited, at least not for the moment. And I can hear them now, Lord, we've, we've left everything behind to follow you, and now you're leaving us, and you're saying we can't come. And we can only imagine the emotional upheaval that they're experiencing right now. But, but, but because, you know, back then when somebody said goodbye, goodbye was goodbye. Chances are they didn't see each other no more. There was no Twitter. There was no phone. There was no text. There was nothing. A good example of this is you can find in, in Acts chapter 20 where Paul, he gave his farewell speech to the people of Ephesus. He said when, these things, when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. Goodbye meant goodbye. Paul was leaving for, from Ephesus to go to Jerusalem where he would be what? Arrested by the Jews, taken by the Romans, all during the Feast of Passover. Same thing Jesus is going through right now. Now, we have the benefit of knowing what they didn't, but we can identify in the respect that we have no idea what the future holds for us. And, and it can be troubling at times and just leave us in a state of shock. But the reality is none of us really should be shocked or surprised. And here's why. Because we live in a fallen world that is full of tribulation. We're going to have it. It's going to happen. Jesus taught us we would face difficulties in life. Which, of course, runs counterproductive to the prosperity doctrine that's out there today. That stuff's a plague on Christianity. And when people that fall into that, that, into that trap, they face, uh, they, when they face a trial, they become fallen prey because these charlatans have just, it's just messed their minds up. And when that tri time comes, they're not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And they fail. They fall hard. Jesus is the truth. 
And that's why he doesn't spare his disciples while revealing to them the things that are about to take place just hours from this very moment. They needed to be prepared. We need to be prepared when things like this take place. And it's not through yet. Look here. Jesus says he reveals Peter's denial. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I go, you cannot follow me, but you will follow later. Warren Wiersbe said that Jesus, he didn't rebuke Peter for asking the question, his, but he said his reply was somewhat cryptic, that he would one day follow Jesus to the cross, and he did. He was crucified, but not yet. Peter still has to die to self. Peter's still in the flesh. He says in verse 37, he says, Lord, why can't I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Now comes the bombshell. Verse 38, Jesus said, you will lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. This here was the real shocker. I mean, here's their leader, their spokesman, their go-to guy, the guy who's not afraid to ask the tough questions. I believe some of them goaded him into asking the questions because he knew he wasn't scared to ask. They wanted to know the truth, but they were scared to say anything. Peter, hey, man, you go ahead and do it. <laughs> and Peter would do it. He, Peter would do it. But here he is. He's the man who's being told that he's going to deny the Lord. So this brings us to our next question. Why would the disciples need to be reminded to believe? Because nobody expected this to happen. First betrayal, then departure. But the one whom they thought would never run or never waver... He's going to deny the Lord. This was more than they could handle. Disappointment has overtaken them entirely, and Jesus sees this. He sees it happening. So he reminds them, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For three years, these men have witnessed miracle upon miracle. They've seen lepers cleanse. They've seen the blind made to see. They've seen the cripple walk. They've seen the elements controlled by a spoken word. They've seen the dead raised and walk away. And they've heard the kind of preaching that the only one who could preach like that was the person who wrote the book. He was the author of the book. And with his preaching, what did he do? He dismantled all the man-made traditions, everything that the religious Jews had, had put out there, and he exposed their hypocrisy. Well, the whole purpose of this gentle admonition is to assuage their grief. The Lord knew that they would be unable to bear the weight of this revelation. He understood them. He knew them better than they knew themselves. He was a man of constant sorrow and acquainted with grief himself. Isaiah 53, 3. He voluntarily experienced hardship, physical limitations, disappointments, and was tempted on e in every conceivable way. Even though they didn't know the pain he was feeling at the moment. Because he was in a lot of pain. But he understood theirs and he felt theirs. So he reminds them of a saying, believe in God, believe also in me. He said this to affirm his deity and his place alongside the Father where their faith was concerned. In calling them to a place of their hope in God, he's called them also to place their hope in him, to assure their faith. The Greek word for believe is pastuo, and it means to be persuaded fully of or to place full confidence in something. In this case, that would be the providential care of Christ. To believe, is a, to believe some in, in Christ is an action, a conscious decision to obey the commands of the Creator. Amen. Now follow me here. Depending on your preferred translation, the word believe can be taken in two different moves. Okay? King James says, ye believe in God. Now this can be taken in, a, in an indicative mood which expresses fact, opinion, or assertion. In other words, by translation, Jesus is stating a known fact with no dispute, establishing that they believe in God. You guys believe in God. And the second part of this phrase, believe also in me, is in the imperative mood, meaning that Jesus is giving them this statement to his disciples in the form of a command. He's saying, so you believe in God, believe in me the same way. Believe in me the same way. But Alexander McLaren wrote this. He said, we get a more true appropriate meaning if we keep both clauses in the same mood and read them as imperatives. So the New American Standard is written in an imperative mood. Seeing the sadness in their faces and perceiving their discouragement and doubt. They see, he sees it trying to creep in on them. He, in command form, Jesus said, believe in God. He's, I'm not asking you. I'm not saying you are believing in God. He's saying, believe in God. Believe also in me. Guys, don't give up on me right now. Right now their world is being rattled and they're about to be shaken to the very core. Everything that they've been taught and believed is about to be bent to the breaking point. They heard the Lord say to the Pharisees on different occasions, I and the Father are one. 
And they heard Peter proclaim in John 6, 69, he says, We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They have fully pushed all, put all their faith in Christ. And having left everything to follow Him is the evidence of that fact. But the faith is, their faith is going to be put to the most extreme test. And here in just a few hours, they're going to witness the most horrific scene in all of human history. God in human flesh nailed to a cross for the sin of the world. I seen a post on Facebook this morning. God hung naked before the world and died. Can you imagine a thought like that? If seeing something like this, would, if you saw a scene like this, it would rob you of any hope and utterly destroy your faith. And Jesus knew this. This is why He says this in an imperative mood to assure their faith. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. God's Word is full of encouraging imperatives. The Lord said in Isaiah 41, 13, He says, For I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. Christian, what struggles are you currently engaged in right now? What burden was waiting on you at the foot of the bed this morning when you got up and you stepped into it like a pair of bedroom slippers and drug it through the house? And the way it looks at the moment, tomorrow is not looking too promising either. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God's provision. Believe in Christ. Well, this brings us to our second point, the Lord's glorious accommodations. Now, I have three things I want to point out here to you. First, these accommodations are provided by the Father. Look at the verse, part of verse 2. He says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Now, the Greek word for dwelling places is the word mone, and it has several different meanings, but dwelling places is used here in reference to many rooms or apartments. King James interprets the word as mansions, which is a correct term. But over the last 400 years, we've lost the correct meaning of that term. When 17th century translators referred to the word mansions, they weren't looking at a 20,000 foot square building. They were looking at rooms and apartments. Now follow me. In Jewish, ancient Jewish culture, all marriages were arranged, right? Everybody knows that. The father chose the bride for his son. During the betrothal period, which usually lasts one year, rooms were added onto the father's house. Now these accommodations are prepared by the son. Look again at verse 2. Jesus said, For I go to prepare a place for you. The moment the betrothal began, the son immediately went to work, adding to his father's house in anticipation of his wedding day. And these accommodations are prepared for the bride. Look at verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The son has promised to provide for his bride a home. And once his project is complete, he goes to receive his bride, and he takes her to his father's house where they will live for the endurance of their marriage. Now here's the spiritual significance of these same three points. First, these accommodations are provided by the Father. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. This is heaven. This is where God lives. God in His mercy and grace has provided for us a dwelling place so that we can live with Him. But He's also provided for us a way to get there. And that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. How great is that? That we get to live in the Father's house. Not down the road from God, in the Father's house, in the presence of God. Secondly, these accommodations are prepared by the Son. Christ promised this to His betrothed. Look at verse 2 again. Jesus said, For I go to prepare a place for you. Because of the obedience of the Son to the Father, this has been made possible. He has prepared the way by taking on human flesh and becoming a perfect sacrifice for whosoever will. And by believing in His atoning work, they can and will be saved to enjoy everlasting relationship with the Father. That's a blessing. Thirdly, these accommodations are promised to the bride of Christ or the saints. Look again at verse 3. He says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. We are promised eternal life to live in the Father's house where we will rule and reign with Christ forever. Ephesians chapter 1, verse, at the very end of verse 10, in verse 11, it says, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. The Father chose the, for the Son His bride. We are the chosen bride. John chapter, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. What's the wedding reception going to look like? Revelation chapter 19, 
verses 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And finally, let's look at our last point, the Lord's gracious affirmation. Look at verses 4 through 6. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now I have four things to point out here straight from the text. First, Jesus says, I am the way. He's the eternal door to God. Psalm 118, 20 says, This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. The way of salvation is through a narrow gate, Matthew 7. Jesus Christ is that narrow gate. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 27, He says, All things have been handed over to me by the Father, by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And anyone whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Now, there is positively no other way to know God except through Christ. Man's only hope of eternal life lies in having an, an intimate knowledge of God, and this is possible only through Jesus Christ. This divine truth can only be divinely perceived and divinely imparted. The Bible is the only source of accurate divine truth of God, and when it comes to matters pertaining to salvation, that can only come from Christ and come through Christ. Secondly, Jesus said, I am the truth. He is the eternal Word of God. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Jesus not only spoke the truth, He was and is the embodiment of the truth. He does not speak to God. He is God speaking. And the Word was God. And the Word was God. When rabbis taught, they taught by oral tradition, which means they cited other rabbis. When Jesus spoke, particularly on the Sermon on the Mount, He never cited a single rabbi. Instead, He said 13 times, But I say to you, but I say to you, not Rabbi Eckstein over here, I said to you, Jesus Christ is sovereign. All power has been handed over Him and His Word and His truth and ha has and will continue to stand for all time. Thirdly, Jesus said, I am the life. Well, He's the eternal gift of God. Jesus said in John 10, 28, He says, I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is life itself. He said in John 1, 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. If a person wants to experience true life and to know what it's all about, then he must come to the source of all life. And they must come to Christ. Paul said in Philippians 1, 21, he says, For me to live is Christ. Now, how could he make such a claim? He believed the purpose of the Christian life was to manifest the life of Christ in our own body. And why is that? Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5.15, So that they who might live no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's why Paul could say with confidence, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that is now that, lives in the, that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That Greek word for life is zao, and it means to enjoy real life. And real life is Christ's life living in us. He has taken up residence in all who believe in Him, and that know that His life, and they experience the life that He wants to live through them, and He wants them to have. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Is Christ your life? Is He being revealed in your life? And finally, Jesus said, No one comes to the Father but through Me. He's the only access to God. 
He's the only access to the Father. I know I've already touched on it, but it's worth repeating. Jesus Christ is the only way to experience a loving and eternal relationship with the Father. Many people say there's other ways. No, there's not. There's no other way to God but through Christ. He is the door. He's the door of the sheep. We're the sheep. He's the narrow gate. He is the manifestation of the Father's mercy and grace. He is agape love veiled in human flesh, providing for us the only way to enter into an everlasting relationship with the Father. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for me. He is Jehovah Rohi. He is my shepherd who leads me to God. Christ is Father's provision for the deepest need of every sinner. Herbert Locker wrote this. He said, God will provide for Himself a lamb. God Himself, in, person, in the person of His Son, provided the lamb without blemish and without spot for the deliverance from sin's curse and dominion. At the cross He became the universal provider for our redemption, providing life for our death, atonement for our guilt, strength for our weakness, heaven for our hell. Because God spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for all, in virtue the Lamb of Calvary, He stands ready to freely forgive us of all things. Romans 8.32 now, I come across this poem somewhere some time ago. I don't know who wrote this poem. I don't know if it's a segment to a, a greater poem or if this is it, or if this is all to it. But I don't even remember where I found it. I don't even know who wrote it, but it's pretty good. It's a pretty good little poem. And, I and it, it's a good thing to remember when you're faced with times of discouragement. I want you all to listen to this. He said, Though troubles assail and dangers affright, though friends should all fail and foes unite, yet one thing secures us, whatever betide, the Scripture assures us, assures us the Lord will provide. And He's done just that. He has provided me with peace and comfort and encouragement in the most difficult of times. And right now, it's one of those times. He's provided me with a, a place to live, food to eat, strength to, to do what He's called me to do. But most importantly, because of His sacrifice, He has provided for me the only way to the Father. And I have been saved by His wonderful grace. Friends, that's the, that's the work of the comfort in Christ. But the only way to experience it is by surrendering to His Lordship. You do that by coming to Him broken and sincere, on bending knee, confessing your sins, and crying out to Him for mercy. And He'll hear your prayer, and, it's, and if your desire is truly to be saved, well, my friend, He will give you the desire of His heart, because the greatest desire He has is not for anyone to perish, but to all to come and have everlasting life. Jesus is the comfort in Christ. And my sincere prayer is that everyone comes to know Him the way that I know Him, especially those that I love, that are not walking with Him. And I hope that's yours as well. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for this time we can come together and study your word. Lord, you know the heart of everyone here today. You know what everybody's experiencing. You know what we all experience. You know the you know when our hearts are heaviest. We just don't really see no way around it. But Father, we do trust in you when we know that you are our provider, Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Rohi. You lead us. To, you, you lead us to God. You lead us to yourself. You draw us in. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you for those arms of yours that just wrap around us when we're hurting. You're so good. Lord, I pray that you speak to every heart here today. Lord, that no one walk out this door with any kind of burden, any kind of struggle, that they come to this altar, or, or even right there in their seat, and just leave it with you, and trust in your provision, and knowing that you're, you're there to take care of us. Yes, we're going to have, there's going to be rainfall, there's going to be times of difficulty, but Lord, we don't have to walk through it alone, because you promised to be with us every step of the way. And we trust in that. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for all things. In Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.